Galatians chapter 5, we're going to finish that up today, move into Galatians 6, that only took us a year and a half. I'm thinking, if it's all right with y'all, uh, once we are done with Galatians, maybe to move in to the book of Revelation, if you would like to, would that be all right? All right. I call Revelation the index. At the end of a big textbook, there's always an index to tell you where stuff is in the book. And I think Revelation does not stand alone from the rest of the Bible. I think Revelation is an index to the rest of the Bible. You want to figure out Revelation? Start reading Genesis. There are things in, Reve in Revelation point you back to that. Or point you back to Psalms. Or point you to Matthew. Or point you to Isaiah. I think the Bible is the best interpreter of the Bible. Amen? That's how we believe it. So Galatians chapter 5, uh, verse 22, the contrast, uh, we focused last Sunday on the works of the flesh, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lascivious, and so on, so on. There's 18 things there. So the contrast to that, what's the opposite of the works of the flesh are the works of the spirit or the fruit of the spirit. And remember... Vines don't produce fruit. They don't manufacture their own fruit. That's done for them. What produces or what makes the fruit that's on the vine? The DNA that's in the vine. We now understand that. We understand that better than all of our forefathers did. Because we know now what makes things, what makes life work. We know that it's a book that generates Life that generates the things of life. And we know that it's the book that produces the fruit of any tree, any blade of grass, any animal, any fish, and any human. The procreation of humans is basically at its core an exchange of DNA. And that's it. An exchange of DNA, something like putting a seed in the ground, and that's essentially what that is. So as we do not produce, or things in this world do not produce their own fruit, it's produced for them by the DNA, that's how these fruits of the Spirit are manifested in our life. A life without the Bible is not a Christian life. It's, the, it's going to be that list above it. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. It's going to be that. Put the Bible in your life. Put the Bible back in our country. Put the Bible back in our schools. See, see what happened we, in the 60s when Supreme Court ruled prayer out of the schools. Preachers back then were warning what was going to happen in our country. And they were right. They were dead on. They said we'd be turned to lawlessness. That's exactly what's happened. Okay? Took 60 years, but it's but from 60, 63 to now. So what is that? Roughly 40 plus another 17. So almost, almost 60 years later. We have this generation of young people that's never known God, never known the Ten Commandments, doesn't care to know about God or His laws. Morality doesn't come into their thinking. So, the fruit of the Spirit, I say when, as it gets darker, that's when the light shines brighter. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. And I'm not going to get too much into those, but I am going to focus on what he said here in verse 24. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. And think about the draw, Roy, of alcohol. 
Why does a person drink alcohol? Because it gives them a feeling. It gives them a, a feeling. They get, it, they, get a, they get a high from it. It's their brain, they can feel it in their, they can feel it in their blood, they can feel it in their nerves, they can feel it in their body. And that's the draw of it. That's the, what draws people to it and the effects that it has. And when people who have taken their first drink, they experience that, then we immediately think if one is good, two is better. And then three. Notice I'm using fingers. Isn't that how they measure it? With fingers. I mean, three fingers. Okay? But it's a trap. The things that we lust after. So, the way it is with alcohol, same way with drugs. Those who drink used to just really get on the people that took drugs. To me, no different. Because the draw of drugs is a high. It makes your mind feel good. It makes your body feel good. And people are drawn to that. Just like with alcohol. It's just a different type of drug. Okay? Do what? Yeah. One's illegal and the other's illegal. Well, it depends on what state you're in. If you're in the state of inebriation, then it's all right. Anyway, um, they, that, they, that are, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the effect, affectations or affections and lust. The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the draw that sin has. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory. Provoking one another, envying one another. So the object that Paul's trying to get across here is if you want that fruit of the Spirit to grow and to manifest, and there's nothing uglier than having a garden full of wonderful fruit or wonderful flowers that are crowded out by weeds and thorns and thistles. You've basically, you've destroyed the beauty and the purpose of that garden. You've destroyed it. And that's the point he's making here. Kill off the weeds. Kill off the thorns and the thistles. Get them out. Get them out of the garden of life to let that fruit be nurtured and grow. And that's what he's talking about. Uh, being crucified with Christ. Turn to uh, Romans 6. Romans chapter 6. Romans 6 is um, what I tell people, sit down with them and talk about baptism. Show them what baptism means, what it represents. Uh, when I get back from vacation, um, Robert, who sits back here, um, and he works, he's the cook over at Rich's Frozen Custard. Um, he's going to be baptized. And I told him, read Romans 6. I, I first started out, read verses 1 through 4. Then I looked at it and said, no, better read verses 1 through 6. Then I looked at it again. I said, just read the whole chapter. You'll get it. But he says, Romans 6, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No, because if you get, say, if you, if you get to the point to where you want to be right with God... You are at the point to where you realize sin is not what you want anymore. You don't want this stuff in your life anymore. And so you want that change. But anybody who feigns salvation makes a fake temporary decision like they want to follow God, but they have no interest whatsoever in removing the sins out of their life or having them removed out of their life. That is a very ugly garden. And it's not right. Shall we, so, and God didn't save us 
and give us grace and liberty so that we could continue in sin, that grace may abound. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us, and this is what, this is what baptism is, so many of us as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death. Does sprinkling show death? This does. Okay? It's what we do. So, therefore, verse 4, we are buried with him by baptism, not water baptism, Holy Ghost baptism, being baptized by the Spirit of God. We are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Someone wants to come to this church, be a member, that's fine. I'm going to ask them, were you, were you water baptized? Were you by immersion, not splashed? Were you baptized by immersion? Name the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. They say, yeah, I'm fine with that. Some people choose to be rebaptized. That's fine with me. Uh, but that's the formula for baptism right there. And that's what Philip did with the Ethiopian eunuch. The eunuch said, see, here is water. What does, and he didn't, wasn't holding a cup of water or a little bowl of water. They came to a place where there was water. See, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? They went down into the water, the Bible says. And then when they were done, they came up from the water. And as soon as they came out, Philip disappeared. Imagine that. Imagine being the eunuch going... Where'd that guy go? And then imagine being Philip going, where am I? Because he's automatically in a different place. I'd like to make movies of some of that stuff. Amen. Anyway, so he says now, where was I? Yeah, here we go. At verse five, for if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, this is what I did with my dad. My granddaughter, I didn't bury them to be forgotten. I planted them in hope. George, you didn't bury your mother to be forgotten. You planted her in hope. And there is hope. Amen. So if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Yeah, say something. I know it. Nope, ain't like that at all. <laughs> I I think the the fake Christians might say that put on a show but the real ones who've been around they know better they know better they've been in this book they've experienced life how it really is and they know that some days it's not a picnic and we're not walking in the garden of God every day and so he's talking about this whole thing here in Romans 6 he's talking about this this happens daily how many times how many times a week do you go to bed at least seven. At least seven. All right? And in the morning, you get back up again. And it's something that God said back in Lamentations that His mercies are brand new every day. Every day you wake up, God's buried you, the old man, raised you up again. And everything that was yesterday is yesterday. And we didn't even know it while we were asleep. But God was just taking it all away. Overnight. We wake up the next day and it's a brand new day. God's mercies are renewed that day. It's another day to try to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Happens every day. Uh, and, and this is and when Jesus said... He said it two different ways in two different Gospels. In one Gospel, Jesus said, you must take up your cross and follow me. And then he said, 
he who is not willing to take up his cross daily and follow me. It means every single day you take that cross, crucify this flesh, don't yield to it, kill it. So he says in verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is, and that's always present tense, is right now crucified with him. The old man is this flesh and the lust that it has. That the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So whether God allows you when he saves you to live a long life and throughout the course of that long life, God is one day at a time killing off the unfruitful members of your body. He's killing them off. We all know what happens with age. Things just start going wrong in our body. Okay, The things that we could do and did do in our youth, we don't even think about those things anymore. Those are gone. God's crucified those things. He's killed them off with age. God will either do it that way, or I've seen him do it this way. God will save somebody and then take them. Take them. Kills them off all at once. Why does he do that? It's his call. But he's the one that does it. Amen. One way or the other, these, this body of flesh is mortified, crucified, cut off, over with. And we want it that way. We want it that way. Amen? That, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Amen? So I can't wait some days to die. Because then I'll be free. Be no more one day at a time, Roy. It'll be one day, all day for eternity. Amen. Verse 8, now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we all shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. And that's what awaits each and every one of us. Back to Galatians. Turn back to Galatians now. Chapter 2, which we've already covered, but there's something I'm going to point out to you again. This is what Paul said. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. That's why what he said back in Romans was a present tense. We are crucified in him daily, every day, presently, right now. God is mortifying, mortifying things in our life. He's killing off the deeds of the flesh. And you have to admit, like, like Gary said, when you first get saved... Yeah, you feel great. You know, your sins are forgiven. And for a while, you stay up there. But the devil moves in immediately with people. Starts working back to get them back to the old ways again. And over time, even the things that you did after you first got saved, God started taking those things back out of your life. One after another after another. As I would want people and God to be patient with me, so must I be patient with others that I see who I believe are in Christ, but they struggle from time to time with this, that, or the other. And every time somebody gets back into sin, God brings them back out, but he uses that to further mortify the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and of course the pride of life. There's always going to be a thorn there somehow, some way to keep you humble, to keep you on your knees, keep you crying before God, to keep you yielding, and to not get too arrogant or cocky about your faith and what it is that we believe. Back in Galatians 2, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet... Not I, but Christ liveth in me. That's the new man, the inner man, 
that which was born of God. That's the thing that John was talking about in 1 John. When he said, that which is born of God sinneth not. Which has, it's thrown some people, and some people have used that to preach false doctrine. To say, well, if you're really saved, you don't sin anymore. Like, I don't sin anymore. And I'm going, really? Like, you don't sin anymore? I've heard that from people. I had a guy, I'm not kidding you, I had a, uh, uh, he belonged to a church, was an elder in a church that believed the doctrine of instant sanctification. Once you're saved, you don't sin ever again. The guy had, had heard me somewhere, and he was traveling through, and he's in my office bawling his eyes out. Because the pastor of the church was an older man. He'd been there for years. Quite, you know, fairly decent-sized congregation. His son was sort of in training to take over dad's position when dad retired or whatever. But his son, Brother George, was messing with this guy's wife. And they were both, they had a meeting at the church over it. And the elders met and decided that technically it was an adultery. So therefore, it's not sin. Case closed. And I asked him, because he's in my office bawling his eyes out. He basically got run out of his own house. And I said, so I know what your church believes. And I said, they believe in instant sanctification. I said, so how does that work? And he told me the truth. He said, they just say it's not sin. When you believe that you don't sin after you're saved, but then there's sin, well, then you don't change your doctrine. You just change the sin. And say it's not sin. And then see, we're still right. I think that's abhorrent to believe a doctrine like that. Amen? It's wicked to believe that. Because that's what they did. They basically wrote that whole thing off as it technically was. I won't get into the details of what he told me, but he said technically it's not adultery, so therefore it's okay. Boom. He said, I'm out of here. I'm not going to stay with this mess. Anyway... The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When we get to heaven, we owe Jesus a great big thank you, don't we? For loving us and for thinking of us when he died for us. We were on his heart. And then over, we're going to scoot ahead a little bit, Galatians six fourteen. Paul said this, but God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. So when I started examining several years ago what was going on in churches all around the area and all around the country, I found out that some of these churches that had been established for years, they were changing everything. And they have to build a new building. Some, the old preacher leaves, a new preacher comes in, and he's full of Rick Warrenisms. And he comes in and says, we're going to change everything in this church, and we're going, to get, we're going to build a new building. Why do we need a new building? Well, he's not going to tell them everything, but his plan is to remove all the crosses. So as not to offend people. And that's what they do. They take the crosses down. They don't have a cross in the front. Don't have one on the steeple. Don't have, don't have one back there. They would take that down. And that's how it would be. Because we don't want to offend anybody. What did Paul say about that? The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. And some of their leaders who have written their, the books that these guys follow mock the cross. They say, we don't believe that God would force his only begotten son into a horrible death to, and that death somehow erases the sins of everybody. They say they don't believe that anymore. They don't believe the gospel then. 
So you have to replace it with a different gospel. And I 100% guarantee you that different gospel, I don't care how they paint it, it's going to be a gospel of works. You must do, you must perform, you must do this and do that. You must be right 100% of the time. You must make Jesus Lord. That means you'll never sin. See, now we're back to you'll never sin again. And they're putting it into the will of the flesh, your salvation, instead of what Jesus did on the cross. And they're removing and staining the glory of Jesus Christ on the cross. But Paul said, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. I can see over time, you know, my wife, I'm kind of cracking a lot of jokes about myself this morning. And my wife's going, are you in a foul mood? I said, no, I'm in a comical mood. She doesn't sound like comedy to me. I said, yeah, I'm poking fun at myself. I'm in a laughable, comical mood today. I am. And I love jokes. I love good jokes. I like to hear good jokes. And I used to love to watch Comedy television, sitcom, situation comedies. I used to watch those things and laugh and steal their jokes all the time. And over time, I would hear these jokes I knew were mocking God. I used to watch Saturday Night Live. And then they kept repeatedly portraying Jesus in a very wicked way. And I said, I'll never watch this again. And I didn't, I have not ever watched it again. It made me mad. That's my savior. That's my best friend. That's my God you're talking about. So I never watched it again. And then other comedies. I mean, I still like the jokes. I like to cut up. I like to be funny. But they're going to talk about things I just don't care for. Turn them off. I don't want to watch them anymore. I'll come up with my own jokes. I can be funny without them. Or at least I think I am. But over time, you can see in the, your life the things that God has mortified in you. God mortified them. God killed them off. Didn't he? Or did you do it yourself? Okay? Gary, the things that you did in your past, you don't do them anymore. Who killed him? God did. God mortified those things. And so the things, Jaden, the things that God, the things that are going on in your life right now, who's going to kill them off? God is. He's not expecting you to do it. You're dead. Right? You're dead in trespasses and sins. Did Jesus expect Lazarus to help himself raise himself from the dead? I listen, I guarantee you, four days, there's nothing there working. He doesn't expect Lazarus to do anything. His word put life back in Lazarus. And it reanimated the flesh that had been rotting for four days in that grave. His sisters were right. Lord, don't remove that stone. He stinketh. They were right. I've been there. It's bad. But God put it back to life again. The dead, the dry bones in the valley. Did they raise themselves up? Did they bring themselves together? What did it? The word of God. The word of God does it. So you want these things killed off in your life? The word of God will do it. Or the absence of the word of God will allow them to enlarge themselves. That's just how it works. Turn to Romans 8. I usually have these in biblical order, but not today. Romans 8, verse 13. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye, notice he says this now, but if ye through the Spirit, that's the point there, the Spirit and the Word acting together, if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Do you really want to get rid of those sins that are in your life right now? 
do you really want to? And I think God always knows the difference. He always knows the ones who really want it gone and those who don't. And those who really want it gone, over time, God starts mortifying things, killing it off. But it has to be done through the Spirit. You cannot do it. Don't believe the power of positive thinking, nonsense. Don't get into Anthony Robbins and some of these motivational speakers and these, if you think positive thoughts, then God does positive things. And don't think that nonsense. And don't put that into your doctrine because it doesn't work. They make you think it works because they're rich off everybody's money, but it doesn't really work. It's witchcraft. It has to be done through the Spirit of God. God is the one that has to do it. Now turn to Colossians chapter 3 very quickly. Yes, and if we get through this, I'll be done with Rome, uh, Galatians 5. Colossians 3 verse 4. The Bible says, when Christ, who is our life, our life is Christ. You don't have to ask me where I'll be on Sunday. You don't have to ask me where I'll be on Sunday night, Wednesday night. You don't have to ask me, do you really believe in God? Christ is my life. This, this is my life. I don't, have, I don't do other things aside from this. I don't have a double lifestyle that I'm living. This is it. And people don't understand that, but... They themselves, sin is their life. They live for sin and they don't understand our way. But if they would be saved, God would fill them with his spirit. Then they would understand. Yes, Christ is our life. When, who, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall, also we, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. You're going to be up in the air. Everybody's going to see you. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Mortify means kill them. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection. That's inordinate means unordinary. It is ordinary for a man to love a woman. It is not ordinary for a man to lust after another man. Okay? It's not, that's not normal. That's not ordinary. But, believe it or not, I've worked with people who have had those types of inordinate affections and they didn't want them in their life. And I believe God can mortify them out. Now, that kind of talk will get you arrested in Canada. If I'm a pastor in Canada and I'm preaching that kind of stuff, I could get fined. That's the freedoms they've lost up there. And I'm not about to lose them down here. Um, but to help people who want to come out of that lifestyle. The young man that I led to the Lord that AIDS, he was going to die of AIDS. He was in the hospital already. And they sent him home to die. And I point blank asked him, I said, you know that your lifestyle is wrong in the eyes of God. And he went, yep. Yeah. I said, do you want God to save you from that? He said, I do. Do you want God to forgive you of all, that, all those things you did? And he said, I do. And the AIDS had affected his mind so much that he couldn't hardly finish most of his sentences. So as I prayed with him, the sinner's prayer, I helped him remember the words. I gave him little pieces at a time. And he said them. And when he got done, tears in his eyes. I said, where are you going now when you die? He said, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. And then I went to visit him. I've told this story. I went to visit him. There at the house, he was his sister's house. And two of his, I guess, ex-lovers, his friends. I was ministering to him and praying with him. And they caught me aside. We just think it's so wonderful. You're so open-minded. I said, uh, I'm not who you think I am. And I told him, I said, I know he's your friend. And I know he loves you guys. But he told me he realized that the lifestyle that you guys all lived was wrong in the eyes of God. 
And they just stood there with their mouth open going. And there was a militant lesbian there back behind the wall listening to everything I said. She hated me. Oh, she hated me. And I said, but God forgave him of everything he did. And I said, he'll forgive you too if you want him to. And I preached his funeral in this church. She wanted to decorate it with AIDS pens. I said, not over my dead body. Is that going to happen? But God saved him. God, God can mortify. Yes, ma'am. That's a lie. It's a lie. 90 percent of those people were molested as young children by a sodomite, male and female both. 90 percent of them. I guarantee you that's how it started. They got preyed upon as a child. And by the grace of God, because I've known people, I know people right now who men who were molested by male family members, male neighbors, okay? And God brought them out of that and gave them ordinate affections. God can do it, okay? And I'm telling you, this kind of talk right now get me arrested in Canada. They'd be walking in the door about now because somebody would be calling... Somebody out there at that church is saying stuff against sodomites. They'd be marching in. Uh, anyway, move on. Uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. And you may not know how to pronounce concupiscence right. And you may not know exactly what it means, but I guarantee you, you're guilty of it. Amen. All right. Which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. In the which he also walked sometimes. See what Paul said? He said, some of you used to be that way. When you lived in them. But now you also put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. I've had people that, I mean, they couldn't talk unless they f this and deed this and GD'd everything in the world. And God saved it. God will save their mouth too. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge. After the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. Somebody say amen. I'm waiting for a bell to ring. I'm, I'm going to give up. Let's, let's, go to, let's go to prayer. Ding, ding. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for saving us. None of us were clean. None of us were right. We were in all kinds of evil concupiscence. Inordinate affections. Things, God, that would have ruined our life. Father, we thank you, God, for pulling us out of the deep, deep pit. And the slime and the slop that we were in. And Father, we're glad that we are where we are. But Father... Help us to never be satisfied because there's more work to be done, more mortification that needs to take place. Forgive us of our sins. Free us, dear God, from the bondage of this body. Take us all to be with you in glory for the world to see one day.